what is a counterexample? Well, you better figure that out before you start to write the paper. You're enrolled in an undergraduate philosophy course, and in two days from now, the paper is due. And so you've come here to the internet to try to figure out how to write a philosophy paper. So let's just get started. Step one, actually learn the material. So there's two days and the paper is due and the paper is about Aristotle and you don't really understand Aristotle, but you figure you have like four hours worth of time today and maybe four hours tomorrow that you can work on the paper. And so that's eight hours total. And so you only have eight hours. This thing is due the day after tomorrow and you're getting nervous. And so it's time to just start writing this paper already, right? Wrong. You have to fight the urge to just start writing the paper immediately. If you try to write a paper about Aristotle without understanding Aristotle, then there's a 100% chance that the paper will be a mess. Four hours learning the material plus four hours writing the paper is a lot better and a lot more efficient and will produce a lot better paper than just eight hours scrambling to write a paper about something that you really don't understand. That's step one, actually learn the material. Step two, read the assignment very carefully. There are basically two types of paper assignments that you will get in an undergraduate philosophy course. You'll get the specific ones, or you'll get a generic open-ended one, which just asks you to write what I'm gonna call a standard philosophy paper. Let's go through each of these. We'll start with the specific one. Let's say you're given an assignment that says, present a counterexample to utilitarianism. Utilitarianism is the name of a moral theory. If you don't know what that is, don't worry about it. It's just an example. Just know that that's some theory about which actions are morally good and which actions are morally bad. It's some theory. Okay, whatever. The assignment that we're imagining in this example is that you're supposed to give a counterexample. What is a counterexample? Well, you better figure that out before you start to write the paper. A counterexample, and I have a longer video about this that I will link to in the description, a counterexample is a specific type of objection. So what you're gonna be doing is presenting an objection to utilitarianism, but not just any old objection, a counterexample, which is a specific type. And make sure that you're objecting to the theory itself, right? In this course that you're taking, that we're imagining you're taking, right, you may have read some argument in favor of utilitarianism. And the argument is the series of claims that's supposed to demonstrate that the conclusion is true. In this case, we're imagining, you read some argument in favor of utilitarianism, so utilitarianism is the conclusion. The prompt says to present a counterexample to utilitarianism, not to the argument in favor of it. So make sure that the thing you're attacking is the theory itself. We're ready to move on from specific paper prompts or paper assignments to what I'm calling the standard philosophy paper. The standard philosophy paper has two, and really only two parts. You've got your thesis, your claim that you're making. It should be somewhat interesting, hopefully. And you've got the reasons, or the argument, or arguments that you're making in favor of the thesis. The point of the paper is to rationally persuade your reader of some claim. Two quick caveats about this. One is that you might actually need one more thing. That is, you might need some kind of background material uh, before you really get to your argument. If you really need the background material, then include it, and it goes in between the two. The second thing to note is that the standard philosophy paper in most undergraduate philosophy courses is not a research paper. A research paper, as I'm using the phrase, is a kind of paper where you have to go read tons of material. You have to go find that material to yourself. Your professor isn't just giving it to you. You have to go find it in the library and you put it all together and you put in a ton of quotes demonstrating something or whatever. Typically, that's not what we're doing in undergraduate college level philosophy courses. We really just want you to respond to the readings that we've assigned, say something marginally interesting, and clearly demonstrate that it's true. You don't need to go read outside material. Just stick with the stuff that was assigned in the course unless the instructor says otherwise. Now you've read the assignment carefully, it's time to move on to step three. I'm not gonna write step three on the board. 
Step three is write the paper clearly, clarity. That's what you want. You want every word, every paragraph, every page of this paper to be crystal clear. Here is how you do that. Tips for writing a clear paper. Number one, hand in the smartest person's paper. To explain what I mean by this, I need to tell you a little bit about what it's like to be a college philosophy professor. You get a ton of papers handed in to you where the beginning of the paper is sort of like rambling and lost, but the end of the paper is like pretty clear and well written. And when you're writing the paper yourself, you can also sense this, right? At the beginning, it's really hard to get going, but then by the time you're writing the end of the paper, the words just come easily, right? And you know what you want to say and you get it out. Why is that? Why is the beginning of the paper difficult to write and difficult to understand, but the end of the paper comes very easily and is super clear and comprehensible? The reason is that in the process of writing the paper, you come to figure out exactly what it is you want to say and how you want to say it. So, if this happens to you, then you need to do the following. Listen to me very carefully. You need to go back to the beginning of the paper and take those early paragraphs and those early papers and throw them in the garbage because they are poison. They will ruin the whole paper. Those early paragraphs and those early pages, they were written by someone who didn't know what they were trying to say. So you just can't include them in the final paper that you hand in. It's like this. If you have a stupid friend, you know which friend I'm talking about, the one who like if someone spills a beer at a party, they're gonna like slurp it up out of the carpet so none of it gets wasted. I'm talking about that one. Say that they're enrolled in the same course as you and they make you an offer. Hey, I'll write your paper for you. Would you let them write your paper for you? I mean, aside from the fact that it's cheating, you wouldn't let them write that paper because the paper would be really bad. Like, they haven't done any of the reading, they don't understand any of the material, they don't have a plan for what they're gonna say in the paper. Those early paragraphs that you wrote before you figured out exactly what you wanted to say, those paragraphs were written by a version of you that is stupider, in the relevant sense, than your current self. Don't hand in the work of some dumber, less prepared version of yourself. Instead, hand in the smartest person's paper. If you get to the end of your writing process, and finally, as you're writing that last paragraph or two, you feel like you know exactly for the first time what it is that you want to say and how you want to say it, then you have to go back to the beginning again. You're just getting started. Tip number two, use simple language. A philosophy paper is not a place for you to demonstrate that you know some big words. Don't try to use words that you don't understand. It's like my dad, my dad will say something like, I texted you an email. No, dad, you can't text an email. You can text a text or you can send an email. That's how the words are used. But my dad doesn't understand that because he's like old and he doesn't understand those words. Well. If there's some philosophical technical terms that have come up in this course and you don't really understand how to use them and you've tried but you still can't figure it out, fine, don't use them. Just use simple, straightforward language. That's all we're looking for. Tip number three, say exactly what you mean and not something else. Okay, we're gonna need an example to really drive home this point. So I'm gonna write up on the board a couple sentences that might appear in an undergraduate philosophy paper these aren't real sentences that were written by a real student. These are some sentences that I'm making up. It's two sentences. I'm going to read them. In its positivity, mentation, or the psychological inner, moves not just what is in its sphere, but also that without. Subjectivity supports footprints, chemical. What would you say is the biggest problem with these sentences? The biggest problem with these sentences is that they don't make any sense. In its positivity, what does in its positivity mean? Mentition? What is mentition? This is just a garble of words. It's very confusing. Don't do this. Here is my attempt to write a much clearer, much more direct version of the, the thoughts behind what I think is behind these sentences. 
Mental states cause other mental states. Period. That's great. A short sentence. Mental states cause other mental states. And also notice something. We've used the same exact phrase twice. Mental states, mental states. That'll actually come up, I think, as the fourth tip that you should repeat words. We'll get to that in a minute. For example, oh, there should be a comma there. But for example, that's great. Now we're getting an example. Okay. And we know what's coming next. For example, smelling laundry detergent can remind one of one's grandmother. Super clear. Mental states can cause other mental states. For example, so now we're going to get a specific example of a mental state causing another mental state. Smelling laundry detergent can remind one of one's grandmother. Smelling laundry detergent, the smell, that's the first mental state. And the memory of one's grandmother, that's the second mental state. Right? So we get a sort of abstract statement, and then we get a specific concrete example. Very clear structure here. But mental states can also cause physical events. Okay, but we're getting some contrast with what happened before. We get another abstract statement about mental states being able to cause physical events. But then we get another example. For example, thirst can cause me to drink. All right, thirst, that's another example of a mental state. And drinking, moving your arm to drink something, that's an example of a physical event. What we've got here is short sentences, repeating the words that we're using. We've got parallel structure where we get an abstract statement, a concrete example, an abstract statement, and another concrete example. And also, notice that all of the language is very simple, right? The longest word here is detergent. If you write a philosophy paper and the biggest word in your whole paper is the word detergent, you're doing it right. I have another longer video about how to write a philosophy paper where I go through more examples like this, like difficult to understand you know, passages, and then I rewrite them so that they're much clearer, so you get a sense of how to write clearly. But we don't have time for that right now because this is the shorter, quicker video because the internet has a short attention span. Tip number four, repeat words. Sometimes we have multiple words in our language that can be used to mean roughly the same thing good and right. You know, if we say that someone is doing the right thing, or if they're doing the good thing, we might just mean well, the same thing by those, by those two sentences or those two phrases or whatever. But when we're doing academic philosophy, we are often using our words very, very carefully. And philosophers will actually use these two words to mean different things. If you sort of switch between words throughout your paper, then the instructor who's teaching the course is going to be reading this paper and they're going to think, wait, before they said good, now they're saying right. Do they mean something different? But you don't mean something different. And that's just going to confuse them. So instead, what you should do is just use the same word. Use the same phrase throughout the entire paper. I get some resistance on this point because in high school, I was taught and many other students were taught that you should vary your word choice. The idea is that if you use the word, I don't know, cop in one sentence you should use the word police officer and then in the other sentence just so that things aren't boring it sort of like mixes it up or whatever i don't know if that's good advice in other domains but when you're writing a philosophy paper you want that paper to be clear and it's more important that it's clear than that it's sort of like interesting linguistically or whatever so what we do this is the practice in all of academic philosophy is we just repeat the same word the whole time if we mean the same thing and if you don't believe me you can just Google how to write a philosophy paper and read all the stuff. And every single guide that exists written by any philosophy professor or instructor or whatever will tell you to repeat the same word over and over again if you mean the same thing. Tip number five, signpost. A signpost is a sign that you post somewhere to tell your reader what's going on or what's happening. Up here, there are no signposts. Like, I don't know what's coming in each sentence as I'm about to start it or in each paragraph or whatever. But down here, we get the phrase, for example. For example is a signpost. It tells you what's going to happen in the rest of the sentence. It's like saying, hey, I'm a sentence, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you an example that illustrates the thing that came in the previous sentence. That's what those two words, for example, do, and they're extremely useful, and they make the whole paper much clearer and much easier to understand, right? But is actually also sort of a signpost. And then we have, for example, again, what's good about this passage, what makes it clear, is that it tells you what it's gonna do before it even does it. Also, if you're 
you know, listing off a certain number of, of points or items or whatever, then you should number them, like I've done here. You just want to make it clear what's happening when, and the way that you do that is by signposting. Tip number six for how to write a clear paper, we're gonna have to erase some of the stuff on the board to make room for this. Make it clear which ideas are yours and which ideas are someone else's. The primary way that you make it clear which points that you're making are your points that came from your brain and which points that you're making are some other you know, philosopher that you've read in the course or something like that, the main way that you do that is actually with signposting. You'll use phrases like, it seems to me that blah, 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 or so-and-so thinks blah, blah, blah. Those are little signposts that tell the reader who thought this stuff. Notice also that I just used the word me. You're allowed to use the word I, you're allowed to use the word me in your paper, that's fine. What you shouldn't do is you shouldn't just make some unsubstantiated, unsupported claims just because they seem a certain way to you. That's not going to persuade your reader very well. But you are allowed to use the word I, and you should do so if you need to to make it clear which thoughts are your own and which thoughts come from someone else. Tip seven for writing a clear philosophy paper, define your terms. If you're using some term to mean something very specific, then just say exactly what you mean by it. Write a sentence that says, when I use the word blah blah, I mean, and then say what you mean by the word. You can just write a sentence like that, that's great, that'll make the paper clearer, we love that. The final tip for writing a clear philosophy paper is read it out loud. This is the tip that most people are gonna ignore. Like you're gonna watch this video and you're gonna nod along or whatever, but then when it comes time to read your final draft out loud before handing it in, most of you are not gonna do it because you feel silly like sitting alone in a room and reading this thing out loud to yourself. If you are capable of overcoming that sense of silliness or whatever, then your papers are just gonna be better. If you're reading your paper and you stumble when you're reading one of your sentences and then you try to reread it and you stumble it again, like, like you fumble your way through it, you can't read it clearly even though you wrote the damn sentence yourself, well then that's a pretty good hint that that sentence is awkward and poorly written. So you should rewrite it. But wait, I have a complaint, you say. You've given us all of this stuff about how to write our papers so that they're clear, but we've been reading all of this material in this course and it hasn't been clear to me, so why do we have to write clearly when the authors that we're reading in this course didn't write clearly? Okay, good, that's a good objection. The answer though is that the text that we're reading in this course, by and large, are actually pretty clear. It's just that they're written in a different language. Most of the papers that we've read in this course and that you will read in most philosophy courses, they're like real philosophy texts that were written not for you know, the general population, but they were written for other professional philosophers using all of this terminology and all of this jargon that the experts use. You'd be wrong to conclude, oh, this text is unclear. No, 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 it might be very clear, it's just that you don't know the language. We're almost done. I have six more tips about how to write a good philosophy paper, except for that these six ones, which I'm gonna go over very quickly, they don't really have anything to do with clarity. So they're sort of their own list of six things, so I'm gonna erase the board and write them up and talk about them now. Number one, use direct quotes sparingly. Is that how you spell sparingly? I think so. Direct quotes are actually kind of a crutch. You're just retyping the words that someone else has already written. If you can say what they said more clearly, then you should say it yourself. You should just say, so-and-so thinks that, and then just say what they think in your own words. That demonstrates a greater level of understanding to be able to rephrase something in your own words than merely just retyping what they said. The one exception to this is if you are writing a sort of exegetical paper. If you're writing a paper about Plato and the thesis of the paper is not that some claim that Plato made is either true or false, no, no, no. The thesis of the paper, and this will be rare-ish in undergraduate philosophy courses, I think, the thesis of the paper is that Plato thinks something. Right? If what you're claiming is just that Plato thinks something, well then actually you wanna use quite a few direct quotes because the direct quotations are the evidence in your argument. You're saying something like, look, Plato wrote this. If he wrote this, then he must think this other thing. 
In that case, you want to use direct quotes a good deal, but otherwise you don't want to use too many of them because they're a crutch. Sometimes when you're writing a philosophy paper, you're going to have to have an idea of your own. You're going to have to make some sort of original, somewhat interesting claim. What if none of those interesting original ideas have come into your mind? Here's what you do. You make some friends, or if you're not good at making friends, then you, then you call in some favors from some acquaintances or whatever. Talk to them and explain the material to them. Spend 15 minutes explaining Plato and what he said about whatever that you've been reading in this course. In the process of explaining the material to other people, you will clarify it for yourself, and then, most of the time, an idea will just come to you some objection or different way of thinking about it or something, and that's your idea, that's your thesis for the paper. Number three, here's some stuff not to begin your paper with. Since the dawn of time, philosophers have wondered. No, don't do it, because like, you don't know about the dawn of time, and it doesn't matter if philosophers have wondered this stuff, and this is just too cliche and too obvious of a way to start a philosophy paper. Don't do it. Just jump right into the meat of the paper. If the paper is about Plato, then you can say, Plato claims such and such, or whatever. Here's another way that you should not begin your paper, because it's just too cliche. Webster's Dictionary defines justice as blah blah blah. Don't start with this not only because lots of people tend to start papers this way and it's annoying, but also because Webster's Dictionary is just totally irrelevant when you're doing philosophy. You get to define your own terms, we don't care about Webster. And here are some ways not to end your paper. This is just my opinion. So who knows? First of all, I don't want just your opinion when I'm reading your philosophy paper. I want your opinion backed up and supported by some persuasive argument. And so you shouldn't just end on this weak note like, well, whatever, that's just what I'm saying. No, no, no. Make your claim and get out. End the paper. Also, don't end the paper with, no matter what we say here, the debate will rage on to eternity. No, I don't want the debate to rage on. I want the debate to end because you wrote a perfect paper that convinces me of some very interesting thing, conclusively or whatever. Like, you might not achieve that, but no, no, no. Let's not let the debate rage on to eternity. And then the last two additional tips here are actually points that we've already made, but I'm going to write them up anyway. You can use the word I. We've already made that point. You can use that word. Just don't make unsupported statements about your own impressions or whatever. And the other one is you don't need to read other material. Right, because philosophy papers are typically not research papers, so don't go reading other stuff. I'm also going to record a lecture video on how to read philosophical texts for undergraduate courses. If I've already produced that video, then I will put a link to it in the description. If not, then you should search for it somehow.